Uh, hi, I'm Ollie, and today we're going to be going through a mock interview question. Um, it's the sort of thing you might expect in a Cambridge or Oxford engineering interview. Um, this question is similar in style to the ones I received in my interviews a few years ago, and I recommend once I've given the whole question, you go away and have a go by yourself first before watching the rest of the video. So here's the question. Um, I recommend you pause uh, and fully read the question carefully by yourself, uh, paying attention to like all the details. Um, but I'll go through a basic overview of the question. So we have a hollow box um, on the outside, which is in the thick line. And then inside we have a, another mass with a mass M uh, attached to the box by a spring with a stiffness K. And we're interested in finding the mass M so that the box will jump off the table when the mass is released. So it's held down at the bottom of the box. So the spring is extended and then we let go and the mass will move upwards due to the spring and we want to find the value m so the whole box, the outer box, will come off the table. Um, so it's important to note what they mean when they say very slightly or just enough in the questions, it's just enough to make the box leave the table and jump very slightly into the air. Um, what they're asking is for the exact mass or the limit of the mass so that it would just do this. If you made it the mass bigger or smaller, it would either jump more or jump less, depending on which way around it would come out of the problem. Um, so they're interested in the kind of threshold value so that it would just do that. And this is pretty common in these sorts of questions to find the kind of limit values, because um, you can imagine if you made it like, really heavy, it would definitely do one of the actions or really light, it would definitely do the other action, either jump or not jump. Um, so they're interested in yeah, getting us to calculate the kind of uh, threshold value. So once you have an answer, um, you can go to the end of the video to check and there'll be a timestamp uh, in the description to find that bit. And if it's correct, then well done. Um, if not, you can sort of watch through this video and there'll be lots of hints and sort of ideas and comments. And after kind of each one, you can sort of, if something pops into your mind about what to do next, you can pause it um, and then go and through and work through the question again. Uh, if you did get it right, I'd still recommend watching through um, in case there's anything you miss, maybe like an assumption that you sort of made in the back of your mind but didn't state that happened to hold but maybe it wouldn't hold in other questions um, and yeah anything else like that so um, I'm going to give you time to pause the video now and attempt the question uh, and yeah good luck okay so here's the first hint um, it's a fairly small hint in terms of the content but it's um, to draw a free body diagram of the outer box uh, the sort of thing you want to do for all these questions is draw a free body diagram for anything that's kind of got things moving with forces and anything like that because uh, this will show you pretty clearly what's going on, allow you to figure out what you do know, what you don't know, what you need to calculate and stuff like that. And it shows the interviewers what you're thinking of. If you just sort of imagine this in your head and don't say any of it or draw it down, it's hard for them to know that you are thinking along the right lines. Um, so a couple of things. On the left, I've drawn an arrow pointing downwards in a box. And this is just a sign that shows that the convention that I'm going to take for this problem is to define things going downwards as positive. And if something has a negative value, then it's going up. So in this case, I've drawn the reaction force, R, on the bottom of the box pointing upwards. And so when I do it in any sort of equations, like resolving forces, I would do a minus R when I'm doing it, and it'd be plus F and plus Mg. And that means all the forces are defined in the correct way throughout. And we can, whenever we get any other forces out or any other values, we know sort of what direction they would be pointing in. Um, yeah, so uh, pause again now and continue from this point with a question using this free body diagram. Um, and see if that helps. Uh, okay, so the second hint, um, I've sort of split into two parts. You can see the first part uh, alongside the free body diagram um, now uh, in blue. And it's about what the question's asking. So the condition for the box to jump off the table. Um, so in this case, the box will jump off the table when there's no reaction force. Um, Cause you can imagine if the box is off the table, there's gonna be no reaction force that's on the table. There'll be a reaction force between the box and the table. And we're looking for just as that value turns to zero, so it's just leaving the table. And then after that, I just resolved um, vertically um, using the convention I said before, so plus F plus Mg minus R, because I defined R as pointing upwards, and that's equal to zero. In this case, the R doesn't really matter the sign because it's equal to zero. Uh, the important thing is that F and the Mg are acting in the same direction. So we can resolve that to get F equals minus Mg. And F, again, is the spring force. So what the, the force of the spring is acting upon the outer box. Um, so you can pause then again now if you want to continue uh, yourself. I'm also now going to put up another hint as part of this one. 
and this is the two equations for a spring. So the first one, f equals kx, is the force on the spring, uh, given its spring constant and the extension. And the other one is for the potential energy of the spring. Um, so pause again now, trying to use those two equations um, in combination with what we've already done and also some other ideas that will hopefully um, lead you, you know, closer towards the answer. Okay, so I hope you all had a good attempt uh, with those hints. I'm now going to go through the last page of the working, but again in two different parts. So the green stuff first and then some more stuff that will come up. So if after I've gone through the green working, you maybe have some more ideas about how to finish it off, then you can pause again um, and continue by yourself. Uh, a quick note on what I was talking about with the X as well earlier. Again, it follows a convention. So in this case, resolving uh, in the green, we get X equals minus MG on K from combining the F equals KX and the F equals minus MG that we found. And a negative extension is perfectly fine. It just means that the spring is in compression. Um, you could have defined X to be positive when the spring's in compression, and then negative X's would mean the spring was in extension as if when it was pulled down. Either works, um, you just have to pick a convention and stick to it, basically. Um, so then after that, I've written down a energy balance equation. So for B is before with the subscript, and A for after. We're basically saying that the gravitational potential, the sum of the gravitational potential energy the spring potential energy and the kinetic energy of the system is equal before and after. Now, it's important to write down all the terms that could feasibly change in your problem, uh, which are those three terms for this one. You could also maybe consider electrical potential energy and other things in different questions. But for this one, that's pretty obvious. None of those are going to change. So they would just cancel out on both sides of the equation. So you can kind of ignore them. Um, in this case, the kinetic energy is zero both sides, uh, but that's by design of what we're figuring out in the question, and I'll explain that in a second. It could be that in, if you were to ask another thing for this system, you would need to know the kinetic energy. Um, so yeah, for the kinetic energy being zero, before it's at rest, before we let it go, so that should be zero. And afterwards, it will be moving. But what we're looking for is when it's right at the top of the box, so the maximum compression of the spring, as that will push the maximum force on the outer box, making it, um, jump and leave the table. So we consider when the mass is right at the top, it will be stationary. So we can then neglect the kinetic energy after um, as well. So we're left with the GPE and the potential energy before and after. And for the potential energy for the spring, we're just using the half kx squared formula um, from the orange box. And we can see we have a half k, I've called x naught squared for before and x1 squared for afterwards. Um, we can find them out uh, later. We're just putting them in as placeholders now so we know what we need to look for. And then for gravitational potential energy, um, you can sort of set a baseline, like a, a zero level. And I've called that when the box, the mass was inside resting on the bottom of the box. That's when I call it zero. Um, you could call it zero when the mass is halfway up the box and then you have a negative number when it's at the bottom and a positive number at the top. Um, I've done it so it's zero at the bottom and then a different positive number uh, for when it's at the top. And to find that, it's the mass of that um, mass, which we're looking for, m times g, which we're given in the question, and h, which is the height change um, of the mass, which we don't know yet, but we can write down again as a placeholder and find out afterwards. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pause again now, and if that gives you any other ideas, you can go forward and try to finish the question. If not, I'll go through um, the rest of yeah, the working. Uh, okay, so here is the final bit of the working. Uh, the first thing I've done is to find what x1 was, and this is the extension afterwards, and that's what we found earlier with the condition of the reaction force being zero. So we can just put in that x1 is minus mg on k, which we found, and then x0 is the original extension of the spring, which are actually just given um, immediately in the question, and they told us it's 20 centimeters, uh, which is 0.2 meters. Um, it's important to put everything in um, sort of the standard SI units so that everything's consistent throughout. If we use 20 centimeters, um, we'd get the wrong answer as you know, the formulas for F equals MA, potential energies, MGH and everything are defined in the SI base unit. So meters, kilograms, um, seconds, stuff like that. Um, they also gave us L and D in the question. Um, so for the length the, of the spring when it's unstretched um, and the D being the height of the box, it turns out we don't need these. They kind of put them in there as sort of red herrings. Uh, this can be quite common. Um, sometimes you will need all the information. Sometimes you won't. Um, it's a good idea to point out to the like the interviewer saying, 
Uh, maybe they, they also gave us these, but you know, in this case, we don't need them. Um, it could have been that they didn't give us the extension and instead they gave us the size of the box, uh, the string, the spring length that they gave us L and D. And then we could have figured out the extension using sort of um, some geometry and how far everything is from each other. Um, but in this case, they just happen to give it, which uh, simplifies it nicely for us. And then the other thing we need to find is H. And that is the change in height of the box from the starting position to the ending position, which we said at the top of the box. Um, in this case, it will be going from the extension, the original extension, X0, to the bottom, up to the middle, where it's not extended at all, and then also then going up um, further um, X1, the previous, the final extension. So what we get is we get this X1 plus the other extension. But the key thing to point out is the other extension is defined as negative, as that is a compression. And basically, the, as long as you keep all your units consistent with directions being positive in a certain, sorry, um, like displacement, so the extension being positive in a certain direction along with the forces, um, then this will all stay consistent. And the distance between two points is always the distance of the second point minus the distance of the first point, which is why we have x0 minus x1. And when you do work this out, it does, those two values do add um, in the end because x1 is negative. Um, but if you keep it just as algebra, it should stay fine. And this is a powerful tool um, to use because say we were solving for x1 instead and we didn't know if x1 was going to be positive, negative, you know, if the spring was in compression or extension, then this would allow us to find that without taking sort of, well, we do take an assumption at the start of pointing downwards is positive, but we don't say that the spring is definitely in compression or um, in extension. So it's, yeah, it's a very helpful tool. Um, so the next thing I've done is rearrange um, the bottom line of the green stuff to get MGH on one side and the two potential energies on the other side and then divided through by GH um, to get M by itself and I substituted in the value of H we just found the X0 minus X1 and then we can evaluate X1 first with minus MG on K and that comes out to minus 0.1 meters which means the spring is 10 centimeters compressed at the top and if we sub all that in to our value for M it comes out for 0.1 kilograms or 100 grams uh, which is the sort of final answer and in the question they ask for the final mass as a value in grams um, so it's important to if you get you know you'll get it in 0.1 kilograms um, because that's how the sort of units come out in the formula but then you sort of convert that to 100 grams to tell the interviewer that because you know that's what they asked for um, so i hope this was a helpful video going through an example interview question um, if there are any questions uh, you know, feel free to leave a comment